Hallelujah. Give the Lord a shout of praise. Come on, give the Lord a shout of praise. Praise the Lord. Got to get this off of here. isn't it? <laughs> Are you having a good time yet? Yeah. Yes! Praise the Lord. Well, it's always a wonder and a blessing to be in God's presence, and it's always a wonder that I'm invited to minister. <laughs> That's always uh, amazing to me, but I praise the Lord. I praise the Lord that we live in the day that we live in. We live in such prophetic, awesome times. This is such an opportunity for the body of Christ. And we know that it's harvest time. It's been declared that many, many of the different speakers. And, and I think you sense it in your own spirit. And the reason that the Lord is raising up the church right now and he's releasing us and renewing us and refreshing us because I feel like what's been happening the last decade has been for the church. Amen? It's God's preparation upon the church to get us ready to be the harvesters for harvest time amen and so when we use the word revive it's uh, you have have had to live and die and be resurrected in order to be revived now the sinner out there he hasn't been born again yet so he has not been made alive in Christ so I believe that the word revive is really for the church and so God is breathing upon us and the bones are coming together and the sinews coming upon the army and God's getting ready to march us forth as, uh, as servants of his to reap the mighty harvest. I wanna, I wanna uh, speak just briefly about a few little things that are on my mind before we actually get into the message. One of the things is um, kind of a PS of what Dottie was speaking about last night concerning what's going on in America. That can't be too far from most of our minds though. I understand that the farther west you get, the, le the less impressed you are by what happened in New York or in, um, uh, in Washington, D.C., because it wasn't as directly um, emotionally attached to you. But one of the things that I'm seeing in this, and uh, bear with me because, again, uh, we don't want to put it on a downer, but for s several years now, we've been saying that the reason that God has given us an opportunity or is giving an opportunity for the church in America to repent, that that's what this revival is all about, to bring repentance to our nation. But if we do not go through that window of opportunity, we could wake up the next morning and everything as we know will be forever be changed. And um, now everything has not forever been changed. America, we are a little bit more cautious about the way we travel. We're looking at people a little bit different and uh, so on and so forth. But as far as for the most of us, we still get up, put on our shoes, you know, do the, you know, do the whole routine every day. And we get back very quickly to uh, life as it was before. But we need to see the bigger picture. God is on the move. And he is going to move in America in a way we have not even imagined. But I don't know that it's gonna be necessarily comfortable. Is that okay? God is getting his body ready right now. He is equipping us. He is teaching us faith. He is teaching us to, to depend on him, to look to him for our provision, to look to him for our healing. I mean, if things change tomorrow and we didn't have any medical coverage, what would we have to do? We might have to believe God for healing. <laughs> Yeah, we always wonder why do we have more uh, healings in third world countries when we go and minister there? It's because they don't have the dependency upon a medical system, and I, you know, I have medical coverage like everybody else, so I'm not, I'm not um, putting that down. But I'm saying that there's not such a necessity for faith. It's the same way with our. We are a blessed country. We are financially blessed. Even the poorest of the poor in America lives better than many people shall we say, the greater percentage of the people around the world. All you have to do is travel a little bit for that. But I believe that God is especially wanting us to focus 
not only our prayer on the Muslim nations, as Dottie was talking about last night, but upon Israel. We must realize that so much of what is going on has to do with Israel. When the Lord caused the walls to come down, the, the um, dividing wall, the Berlin Wall to come down, what happened? There were many, many, many Jewish Russians that were able to make their aliyah or their return to the land. God has the last 50 years when Israel became a nation, 1948, a little over 50 years. When that occurred, it was one of the greatest prophetic illustrations upon this planet of God's faithfulness. He'd given a land to a people and he is positioning his people in that, back into that land for a great revival. Amen. That's what the Bible says. We read in Romans 9, 10, and 11, it said if the cutting off of the, of the natural branch was, was good for us, how much more when they're grafted back in will it not even be like life from the dead? So we as the, as the Gentile church need to be always praying for Israel and for God's natural seed line, the ancient seed line. We are Israel by faith, but there's still a natural heritage and inheritance for his seed. If we, in my lifetime, okay, I, let me put it this way, in my lifetime, I never imagined that the Berlin Wall would, be, would come down and that the Russians would be free. We would be able to go into Russia uh, with the gospel and so on because we were raised our entire life with them being behind the Iron Curtain all of a sudden the curtain is 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 the veil is split and uh, the gospel is able to go into that nation I believe a very large part of it was for the exodus of the Jewish people back into their homeland the Ethiopians that have Aliyah to um, Israel what ha what was the reason for that it was because there was great persecution, famine, and they returned to their homeland. Amen? Now, something interesting, for those of you that have read my book, Cross-Pollination, you know that I, I have a firm conviction that the anointing that we are experiencing in all of the different moves of God around the world has its origin in Argentina. So Argentina actually, is, as far as connecting with America is concerned, for about 15 years before we had our, our present day outpouring, they had a, an outpouring in Argentina. So they have more or less been enjoying a revival up until hopefully still going on. It did not affect their nation as much as it should. Now, when we follow the news and we, and we realize what's going on in Argentina, Argentina is a mess. I mean, it's just economically, there were, there were a few months ago or weeks ago when they, they didn't even have a president. They'd have a president one day and then they wouldn't have a president the next day. Everything is in a turmoil. But do you know that of all of the nations that made their return to Israel were the Jewish people from Argentina last year? The largest exodus out of Argentina being transplanted into Israel was from was um, the Argentine people now let's think about this. these are prophetic things that are happening worldwide we need to have our vision larger than just us for no more we need to have our our vision expanded even beyond America amen <clears throat> now there are huge pockets of Jewish people all over America, especially in the eastern region, California, and so on. And the Lord is calling his people back to their land. Amen? Now, I'm just going to leave this with you. If we are, say, 10 or 15 years behind Argentina, and I'm not saying that we would have that much time, but if our nation does not have an overall revival, we may be facing the same extreme conditions and situation as they are in Argentina. Amen? But you know what? There's going to be something good about it. Because there's going to be an exodus. I believe this with my whole heart. There's going to be an exodus of the Jewish people back to their homeland that are going to leave America. Amen? Now, I'm not saying every Jew has to go back to, back to Israel in order to be saved or anything like that. But there's, God's going to have a huge 
deposit of his people back in that land. And they're going to be mightily touched with God's presence for revival. That's just sort of a P.S. It doesn't mean anything with what I'm going to be teaching. I just wanted to bring us up to, to date on, on some of my views as far as what is occurring. So we should not be downcast. We should not be downcast. I guarantee you God has it all under control. <laughs> and all we have to be is in the center of God's will. He, he, Psalm 91, we're talking about all of how God is our refuge. He's going to take care of us. He's going to take care of us. He's going to take care of us. Does he say that we're not going to have trials and tribulations and afflictions? No, I don't read it anywhere in here. In fact, the trials and the tribulations are for the perfecting. They're for the good. Amen? To burn out all the trash in us that needs to get us ready to be who God has called us to be. Now, the title of my message today is Positioning Yourself for His Presence. Positioning Yourself for His Presence. We had a speaker in a couple of weeks ago that had a tremendous, tremendous healing. And he shared in his message about how God caused him to position himself for his miracle. And I began to dwell on that, and I've been chewing on that for a couple of weeks. And I thought, there is, there is nothing impossible, no situation impossible, when God shows up. Amen? So the question is, how do we get his presence? Now, those of us that have been enjoying a move of God, and, and we've seen from church to church, and there's many churches represented here. Glad to see Vonnie and different, different friends where we've been to their church, and they have, oh, God's just moving awesomely. The one thing that we have learned here is God's presence will be realized when there's an open heaven. And so our goal as prayer people, intercessors, as, as priests, as, as Levites, is to see the heavens opened. Now we've learned, we've been learning little by little by little, as long as it doesn't become a form and we fall into a, the same old, same old rut. We've been learning that there are different ways where the heavens are open, uh, through worship, through repentance, and all of these things, and they're all good. But when God's presence is, a, is, is in our midst, or in the midst of your city, or in the midst of our nation, it's going to be easy to come to Jesus. Who is it that draws people to Christ? Is it our good preaching? Is it the, no, 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 no. It's the Holy Spirit. And so there's something about having an open heaven where the Holy Spirit just has free reign wherever. He can just arrest people in the mall. Yeah? He can go after them in the grocery store, in the schools. It will be no big, uh, no big deal for people to get saved. We, we know that history bears out that there have been revivals along that line in the past where entire businesses fell, you know, they, they shut down because they were seeking God. In the days of Charles Finney, there were awesome, awesome things that occurred. People just, just coming to Jesus and some of the great revivals that we read about. And they didn't even have to have a preacher. The Holy Spirit would just begin to move in their home. We have heard of more recent types of of historical events that, that have been closer to our time uh, in, in cities and areas where the Holy Spirit is just gone into, uh, I think it's uh, in, in one of George Otis's book, he talks about um, in an, an Algerian village where people just continued to, to go and to pray and to intercede. They didn't go to evangelize, they just went to that town and they would pray and they would pray and they would uh, intercede and they would walk the city. And one night without anybody preaching without anybody necessarily uh, that had been praying people that were there. The Holy Spirit visited the homes of all of the people in that village. An angel of the Lord or Jesus or in some way in this Muslim village, the gospel was, was, was uh, presented to the people. And when they woke up in the morning, their common testimony was that they had been visited by Almighty God and that Jesus was Lord. So when we're talking about entire nations that are of, of a particular religious uh, persuasion, be they, be they Buddhist or Muslim or Hindu or whatever, we, you know, we start, oh, there's so many of them, how are we going to do? God's got it all under control. He can, he can appear, you know, in the middle of the night 
Amen? Or he can appear in the middle of the marketplace. Amen? He can do it any way that he wants to. We just have to be careful that we don't say, God, this is how you have to do it, and this is how you have to do it. God's God and we're not. I'm so happy to tell you that. And he can move and is moving any way that he desires. So this is an awesome, awesome time to live. But what we want in this conference, every one of us have come here with a high expectation of how to move deeper in God, into God's presence and how, have, how God's presence can move deeper into us. That should be our, our major goal. Not to be, get blessed or anything like that, but just to know Him in a deeper way than we did before we came. And so, Father, I just ask that you'd open up the eyes of our understanding, that you would give us greater knowledge, Lord. Let, uh, let our vision be expanded. Oh, Father, I ask that you would cause us to sit in heavenly places with you so that we could see from your perspective. Lord, let us leave this place, let us leave this conference with a burning desire to see the nations brought to your throne. Oh, God, let us see that it's more than just our individual personal needs, that you are concerned that none should be lost. Your desire is that all should come to repentance. And so, Father, we ask that you would transfer that desire into our hearts. Lord, I ask that you'd open our ears to hear what the Spirit is speaking to the church in this day and this hour. And Lord, I ask that our hearts would be fertile ground for the planting of the seed of your word, Lord. Now, one of the major things that I believe that God is getting ready to do, it's not like he hasn't done it before, but it's kind of a replay, <laughs> rerun, shall we say, and that is that there's going to be tremendous healing It's going to come to the church. Healing and miracles, signs and wonders. I think we can all agree that that's kind of what we're sitting on our, the edge of our seat waiting for. Amen? And so I believe that this is going to be a part of what God is doing in this day. And so I want you to look with me in Luke, the fifth chapter, and the 17th verse. Now it happened on a certain day, as he was teaching, there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Now I know you'll, you'll notice in your, in your Bible that it's in italics, and so that was added by the translators to make it more comprehensive. But in all of the translations that I looked at, every one of them used the word present. In other words, he was sitting there and he was teaching and he was ministering and there were Pharisees there and there were teachers there and they'd come from everywhere and, but the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Now, I don't know about you, but recently I have been seeing a lot more healings and a lot more uh, of God's ministry along that line. I believe that the time is coming where you're not going to go to a faith healer. But his presence is going to so saturate the atmosphere that in his glory, the healings will just spontaneously begin to break out. Amen. And in that, in that there will be no one that will get the glory except who the glory belongs to. Amen. And that's Jesus Christ. So in order to nurture, shall we say, what we believe that God desires to do, we need to constantly be looking for ways to entertain his presence, to have a setting where his presence is, is welcome, where he can just come in and just do whatever he wants to do. I loved what Iverna said, I think it was Sunday morning, that she's right along my... <laughs> We're on the same track. I have often said, how would it be if Jesus showed up in our meetings and he could just enjoy us? And he could just enjoy, and we wouldn't put him to work. Because that's what happened. When he shows up, we want to put him to work. Do this, do that, oh God, do this. And we have a lot of needs, but how about his needs? How about, what does he want? What does he need? Amen? And so we see that the, the picture here or the, the situation was that the power of the Lord was present to heal them. In other words, there was a presence there that brought forth the healing. Now, let us go to Exodus 33. 
chapter 12 through 16. I'm reading from the New King James, in case it's a little different than what you're reading. And Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, Bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know your name, and you have also found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, this is Moses speaking, show me your way, that I may know you and that I may find grace in your sight, and consider that this nation is your people. In verse 14, he's, and he said, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. I believe that there is such an appointment with the church to enter into his rest. It's gonna take some labor, tells us that in Hebrews. But we have an appointment with God to enter into his rest, where we cease from our struggles, where we cease from our doing it. Here we are in ministry. You know, we cease from our ministry, blah, 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 blah. And we begin to move in to his rest. And that's where his presence will go. Amen? There will be a presence. Then he said to me, in verse 15, then he said to him, this is Moses, and this should be what we say, if your presence does not go with us, then do not bring us up from here. Amen. If your presence isn't going to take us someplace, then, don't, then we don't want to go. Amen. That's going to be the criteria of the future for every single person. We need to know his voice. Number one, we need to recognize his presence. And we need to move when he moves. We can lag behind or we can run ahead and we'll miss what God's perfect will is. But he wants us to move at the cadence and, the, and at the heartbeat that he has, is placing in his people as our hearts are being touched with his heart and we're, we're becoming synchronized with him. Then we will understand the times. Very important to understand what times we are in. For one thing, the Lord has given to the church something we forget all the time, and that is the ministry of reconciliation. Instead, the church is constantly dividing, 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 dividing. But he has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. He came to reconcile all men back to his Father. Our goal should be to reconcile, all, reconcile mankind back to Christ. Amen. This is our predominant ministry. To be as intercessors, we are to be peacemakers. If we belong to the Melchizedek priesthood, amen, yeah, Jesus, our great high priest after the order of Melchizedek, not to be confused with um, a Melchizedek priesthood of another religious persuasion, but it tells us clearly in Hebrews that he is our great high priest. And if we are a part of the lesser priesthood, then our ministry, yes, is a ministry of peace. Peacemakers, blessed are the peacemakers, amen? And so this is part of our heritage and what we should constantly be striving toward, laboring to enter into his rest. Now, when I looked at the word presence there, it had to do with the face. Now, Moses had had an encounter with the Lord in the previous few verses where the Lord spoke to him face to face as you would speak to a friend. And, you know, we kind of shudder. We think of Jesus as our bridegroom and this and that and the other and as the great warrior and as the coming king and all that. But we forget that he's also our friend. Amen? He's calling friends to himself, friends that he can intimately trust. A trusted friend is very valuable. They've said that in your whole life, if you have uh, five friends or as many friends as the fingers on one hand, you are a very blessed person. But he wants to bring us into a friendship with him of seeing him face to face. He said, in my presence, I will go with you and I will give you rest. In that place with him, as we are meeting with him face to face, and many of you are meeting him this week, perhaps for the first time in that way. If you haven't, he's going to begin to reveal himself to you in a whole new level. And be open to it, ladies. You're here not just to get blessed, you're here to have your life changed. Amen. But we are changed from glory to glory. Every time we come into God's presence, there should be a continuing changing. 
another word is uh, the presence person, the face. Um, the, with the prepos prep preposition in front of, before, to the front of, in the presence of, in the face of, at the face of, or front of, from the presence of, from before, before the face. So when we're talking about his presence, we're talking about his face. Amen? Now, I want to kind of change gears here for just a moment because I want to look at, look at Exodus 34 and 4. And the Lord gave a revelation of himself to Israel as he spoke with Moses and he said his presence would go. Now he's giving a little enlarging of what that presence entails. In Exodus 34 and 5, it says, Then the Lord descended in the form of a pillar of cloud and stood there with him and passed in front of him. This is when he revealed himself to Moses and announced the meaning of his name. He said, I am Jehovah, the merciful and gracious God. He said he's slow to anger and he's rich in steadfast love and truth. This is the revelation of his presence. This is the revelation of his name. Now many of us know him as Savior. Some of us know him as healer. Most of us perhaps know him as baptizer of the Holy Spirit. We have all different revelations of him. I, I'll never forget, I was, I was in the Brethren Church uh, and wonderfully saved and God changed my life as an adult. But when I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, the night that I received the fullness of his spirit, or the deposit of the fullness of the Spirit. It was felt like it was really full to me. But you know, we leak a lot, so we have to keep <laughs> filling up. But the night that I was baptized in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in an unknown tongue, that night I had a revelation that transferred from the lowly Christ upon the, upon the tree, and that was the Savior that had, had just so delivered and changed my life. All of a sudden, I recognized him as the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings because I felt the power. Amen? But there's a revelation of himself that he wants to show you, and that is, I am Jehovah, the merciful and the gracious God. Oh, he is Jehovah, the merciful and the gracious God. In Psalm 6 and 15, the psalmist says, But you, O Lord, are a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in mercy and truth. And as I've been studying on healing, because it's something I really want to, I really want to see happen more and more, and it's going to happen uh, over this week, uh, this, during this conference too, I believe many of you are going to be healed, as well as set free. There's going to be physical healings that are going to be met, because His presence is here. He was present to heal them. Amen? It's going to be lots of healing, emotional, spiritual, physical, in every way. He wants us to be whole. Amen? But as I've been studying about healing, the one word that keeps popping up all the time is compassion. And I sometimes think that we've gone about this healing stuff the wrong way. Amen? Now, it's true, it says lay hands on the sick and they shall recover, and we've got, you know, the gifts of healing and all that, and in the, we've been taught all of these different styles, and we've watched people when they do, you know, healing ministry and so on. But Jesus only operated out of compassion. And this is why God is so intent upon capturing our hearts. Because unless our hearts reflect what his heart reflects, we'll never see the glory that God wants to d demonstrate through his church to the people, to the lost and to the, and to the sick and dying. It's going to be out of compassion as we are moved by compassion, it talks about the bowels of compassion, the bowels of compassion, the inner, the inner part. And it's not necessarily the, the viscera, but it's more uh, in that word, the bowels of compassion has more to do with the heart and with that, that part of our anatomy, that out of the abundance of the heart. Amen? That's why he's wanting to get our hearts right with him. Ah, oh, there's such glory just hovering on the horizon to be released to the church and we need to be positioning ourselves for his presence amen compassion was what jesus ministered through and i just briefly you can do a study yourself i would encourage you to on the word compassion compassion is uh, 
is like synonymous with mercy. He's a merciful, compassionate, gracious God. And when you begin to study out when he was moved to compassion, and I thought it's so appropriate with what uh, Iverna shared this morning, that one of the things that moved him to compassion was when he saw all of the people, but he saw them as sheep without a shepherd. Sheep without a shepherd. And so this is something we need to be praying for, that the Lord will begin to raise up in you and in the churches that you belong to strong leadership. Uh, shepherds that are able to help position you for his presence and position you for what God is doing. Now, I, I have to say, I, I'm from this church. I had the intercession here, and uh, we have a strong pastoral covering. Our pastor is uh, a man we trust implicitly, and I have been watching him the last year. Well, I've been watching him for quite a few years, but I'm always just in awe of his leadership because he is... He is positioning our church, not just for an um, um, outpouring of the Holy Spirit, but in the things that he's been, he's been ministering the last few months, is positioning us to be able to survive no matter what happens in the world. And this is, this is so necessary as leaders. Now, people get up and they say, we don't want to talk about money, we don't want to talk about tithing, we don't want to do... If you are a pastor or if you are a pastor's wife, or if you are in ministry, we need to teach the congregation about the blessing of giving. Because if they don't have anything in God's repository, they're not going to have anything to draw out of. Amen? And we're not going, and so we need to learn to be a giving, giving people. And we need to share that word. You know, the, the world isn't at all intimidated about talking about money. I mean, they, oh, let's raise a million dollars. Okay, okay. You know, let's do these marathon, the Hollywood, you know, okay, well, we'll do this for, you know, we'll get, we'll raise $14 million in the, no problem. I mean, they're having political dinners. Oh, it's, it's going to be $1,000 a plate. Shell it out, man. They're happy to do it. If we talk about money in church, whoo, people get that sucking lemon face on them, you know. They start snapping their, their wallets closed. Ah, oh, they're not going to make me all. Oh, that's all they ever talk about is money in church. Bring your first fruits into the storehouse that there will be plenty in time of famine. Amen? Well, that's not my message, but I'm patting my pastor on the, on the back for that because, oh, I tell you what, I've been so excited about giving recently. <laughs> I've been digging around trying to find more stuff to give. You know, it's just been awesome because God has moved upon our church in a, in, a, in a tremendous way, and our pastor's goal is to have 100% tithing. We have no idea what God would do if the whole congregation came into that revelation. Amen? So we need to pray for strong leadership. And if you are a leader, you need to ask God, give me your presence so that I will know where I am supposed to lead, where I am supposed to go, what I'm supposed to do. Another time he was moved to compassion was when he saw the multitudes. And my heart... When we, when we go to third world countries or to, to other countries and there are large congregations of people who have never heard the gospel, you don't want to come back home. Because you preach to people who have been preached to and preached to and preached to and preached to. And the surprising thing, and I'm sure any of you that have done, uh, done international ministry, the surprising thing is when you give an altar call, all the people that respond. The first time they, and, and I've asked my in, interpreter, do they understand what I'm saying? Do they, do they, do they get this? Do they, are they getting this? You know, I don't know if you, if you knew this or not. I've heard when we were down in Mexico, the last meeting, the last night that the glory of God came in in healing. And that night a woman, well, the first person that, that uh, um, got my attention had received her sight that night. Yeah, she was blind and had her sight reached. It was in his presence. Nobody laid hands on anybody. There were all kinds of testimonies all over the building because God showed up in his presence. We just worshiped and worshiped and worshiped, and he just did what he does best. He began to heal and to deliver and to set free. Amen. But one of the other things that, that caused him, his compassion to be released, was humility. And those who would entreat him and the persistence. 
those things, you can just read about his healing ministry. I, I would encourage you to because if that's what God's getting ready to do, we need to be students of his word. We need to learn everything we can about it. There's not going to be any formula. I can guarantee you of that. That's the one thing I can take to the bank. He'll ne he never does the same thing twice. Thank you, Jesus. I mean, none of us have the same fingerprint, even on our own hand. I, I mean, you know, what, this fingerprint's different than this. There's nothing about us that's the same. And I, I, I'm always amazed when you go like this and you look at half your face. And then you go like that and you look at the other half and you see that your eye on this side is not shaped like that. You think, There's two people there. Because nothing about us is exactly the same. Now, with ladies, I could even go farther <clears throat> to, you know, to illustrate that. <laughs> no, no, you know, nothing about us is the same. And God loves diversity. We like sameness. We like everything to be exactly predictable. But oh, you know, I, not me. I, I've always craved excitement. <laughs> I, I've never understood those people who want, you know, let's come in at this time and we'll have one song and we'll, and we'll have a prayer and we'll, we'll have a, you know, a special, especially if it's part of my family or me doing the special, and then we'll... And then we'll have the sermon and then we'll, you know, all go home and, or to the restaurants and beat the Baptists there before they get all the good seats in the restaurants, you know. I, I never understood that because there's such excitement when you get into his word. If you're not a person of his word, you're just going to, and you're just depending on other people to, to pablum feed you, you're never going to get the intensity of the excitement that God wants us to apprehend in this hour. It is such a powerful time. I wanted to share because I, there were some uh, ladies from um, uh, Window Rock, right? Or White Mountain? White Mountain, yes. Welcome, welcome. And I met one of the ladies in the hallway there from the White Mountain in Arizona. And we were just last, two weeks ago, we were invited, just one of those things where God swings the door open because we've been proclaiming that the last few years that we want to do a women's conference on the Navajo Reservation. That specifically, I had said the Navajo Reservation. And um, so I, my secretary got a call from Shiprock and they wanted us to come. I think Cheryl's been up there and did a meeting in what, the AG Church. But they, they did it in the school in Shiprock. And, that, and Shiprock, New Mexico, is right what, in the area with, where they call it the Four Corners, where Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, and Utah come together. But I wanted specifically to be on the Navajo Reservation itself. So we did the meeting in Shiprock, and God awesomely moved. And uh, the man who invited me uh, has a ministry for um, those, similar to a Teen Challenge type ministry. Pastor So is his name. And he said that when they, they got the, the facility there, and they began dismantling it. It had been built in 1929, and all the pastors in the town were coming together to help him, you know, to, he didn't have any money, just to call from God to, to go and to do. And so he and his wife followed that calling, and the pastors in the, in the city just began to, to rally around him. And so when they were, uh, when they pulled the wallboard down, on one wall, there was a honeycomb that was the most huge honeycomb that they'd ever seen. Now, it was an Episcopal uh, pastor that had pulled the wall. Oh, and he got all excited. Pastor so, so said, I didn't even know what was going on. What's he getting all excited about? I don't understand. And the, the Episcopal pastor said, oh, oh, God's getting ready to lead you into the land of milk and honey. This is a prophetic sign. Now, this is an Episcopalian, okay? And so when he said, you know, the strangest thing happened, and he began to relate to me. Well, I, I tell you, I got, I got excited. I love the prophetic stuff, you know, not pathetic, but prophetic stuff. So when we were invited to come there, he, he, he told me that I was going to have the privilege of having the president of the Navajo Nation in my meeting. Yeah. And that was very exciting. So the first evening that we had the meeting, we had about 500 people, I would say, there that had come from the Four Corners area. And the president, President Begay, opened the meeting with a prayer and he gave a little testimony for Jesus Christ and welcomed welcomed us and it was so awesome because on the Navajo reservation I don't know what it is on the the Apache reservation but on the Navajo reservation they only have about two percent salvation about two, two, two or three percent that are born again 
Now, the, the Navajo Reservation is one of the largest in the nation. They have like uh, 250,000 people, I believe, but only two to three percent that are born again. Yet, for the first time in the history of the Navajo Nation, they have a president who was born again. Amen. Praise God. And when we, and when we, um, you know, we, I gave him a shofar. It was exciting. That's all. I, I had my own personal shofar, with, and I thought I got to give this to, to to President Begay, because I just, you know, I, I began to speak into him that he was going to lead his people into the promises that God gave. It was awesome, and the, and so he needed he, he needed to have a shofar to blow the walls that come down. You know that that kind of stuff. The Joshua was things. Anyway, he was, uh, he said, oh, I'm going to blow this at my, my next prayer meeting. Now, this man has a prayer meeting that is open to the public on, on the fourth or the last Friday morning of every month in his own home. Awesome. I said, if I come there, can I go to your, oh, yes, 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 yes. In the end, I, and the Lord gave me a message, blessed are the unoffended. Blessed are the unoffended. That's what I ministered that night. And at the end, I, I gave an invitation, and people started coming, some for, for salvation, some for repentance. And, and the president of the Navajo Nation and his wife stepped forth at the altar, weeping. And God just so moved my heart that night. Uh, because those of you that know me know that I, I believe that our First Nation people are a tremendous key to nationwide revival for America. As the host people of this land, they need to be brought forth in their giftings and, and, and we need to see them moving in the prophetic and the different areas of, of, uh, of redemptive purposes that God has called them to. So we are hopefully next year going to do an Awake Deborah on the Navajo Reservation. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. So be following it on our websites and so on. You may want to. You may want to attend. Some of you from Arizona surely would come, right? And I told us. I told them in the Navajo Nation. I said, you know, uh, there's some walls up among the tribes here. I said, how's about let's ironing this stuff out between you and the Hopis? And they, okay. <laughs> well, that's kind of an inside thing if you live in Arizona, which I did. I lived there for seven years, and I never wanted to leave Arizona. Because that's the most beautiful state and the skies. Every day I'd get up and I'd say to my husband, I said, would you look at these skies? Would you look at the clouds? Would you look at the beauty of this, of this, this state? And I can understand why uh, those that live like in the, like where the Navajo Nation is and the Zunis and the, and the Hopis and so up, and, and, and also in your area, it is so beautiful. You know, Monument Valley and all of those areas up there, they're just almost mystical. So you can understand why the people would get into a mystical mind about it. But, oh, there's only one spirit. Amen. The Holy Spirit. And I believe that people are drawn into these other things because we as the church have not proven anything but religion. We have not shown anything but religion. And God wants us to show the compassion and the love of Jesus Christ. Now in Mark, Mark the first chapter, the 40th through the 42nd verse, let's look at some examples here of people who positioned themselves for healing. Then a leper came to him, to Jesus, imploring him, kneeling down to him and saying to him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Well, if that isn't a revelation for some of us, and Jesus moved with compassion, with compassion, put out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. As soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Matthew 20. Oh, there's so many different ones. The, the, the woman uh, with the issue of blood, the woman that, with the spirit of infirmity, uh, on and on and on. We can see these people who have positioned themselves to receive from his presence. Matthew 29, verse 20, verse 29 through 34. Now, as they went out of Jericho, a great multitude followed him. 
And behold, two blind men sitting by the road, when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, this is the perseverance, they cried out saying, have mercy on us, O Lord, son of David. They were crying out for mercy, for compassion. Have mercy on us, O Lord, son of David. Then the multitude warned them that they should be quiet, but they cried out all the more saying, have mercy on us, O Lord, son of David. So Jesus stood still and called them and said, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. So Jesus had compassion and touched their eyes and immediately their eyes received sight and they followed him. Now in order for God to use us in that same way, to bring forth miracles and healing and deliverance to the body of Christ, and he will use you as a catalyst, just like, like Iverna was saying, you can, you can influence your whole pew. You can position your whole pew to receive healing. <laughs> when the glory and the presence of God comes in, you can position all the people around you to be ready to receive his healing. And you can move in and you can begin to get an open heaven over you that will get an open heaven over, amen, where his glory and his presence, and it doesn't have to be preaching, hey, you know, you can be, God can just sovereignly use you. Do we realize how powerful our body language is? Oh, my, my. I know my husband's. <laughs> he doesn't have to say a word. I can tell what kind of a day he had by the look on his face. Can you? I mean, just the position. I don't even have to see his face. I can just see behind him, the way his shoulders are. <laughs> Verl knows what I'm talking about. We know exactly what kind of a day they had because of the body language and posturing. How important it is for us to have the right body language when we're in church. We need to have the position of worship and praise and openness and all that. And we'll begin to open up the people around us. Amen? If we're to be used of God to see miracles, we must possess the same attributes as Jesus. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. First Peter, the third chapter, the 8th through the 12th verse. Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers. Be tender-hearted. Be courteous not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. If you bless, you will inherit a blessing. For he who would love life and see good days, uh-oh, that means healthy days. He who would love life and see good, healthy days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace, uh-oh, there's that word again, and pursue it. We have to pursue peace because as it's been pointed out to us today, as soon as you declare I'm gonna be a peacemaker, <laughs> guess what? Oh, are you gonna be, t as soon as you declare I, I wanna be full of God's love, <laughs> yes, everything will be tested because you know what, we're not perfect yet. We're not even close to it as far as his flesh is concerned. Oh, he's got a lot of overhauling to do. Amen? For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now, I want to have his happy face. <laughs> I don't want to have his face of disapproval. I want to have his happy, because that is also going to be revealed the face of the Lord is going to be against those who do evil. I want to see his face saying, well done. I want to see his face saying, come in, come in, come on in, come on in, come on in, snuggle. That's what I want. I want that. I want that. Amen. In order to position ourselves for his presence and intervention, we need to do this. <laughs> this is going to be so practical. You're going to say, I've heard that scripture over and over and over and over and over again. But we're talking about positioning our nation for revival. We're talking about positioning uh, the, the church for great healings and deliverance and ministry. We're talking about positioning ourselves to, to uh, see his will down here on earth. In 2 Chronicles 7, verse 12 through 14, 
Then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I've heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. Now this was a time of peace. In Solomon's reign, they have just dedicated the temple. Everything seemingly is fine. Their economy is great. You know, they're, like I say, they're at rest with their enemies. They don't have any problems, so to speak. And the Lord gives him a word out of season for a season that's coming. Amen. He said, when I shut up heaven and there is no rain, you say, oh, would God do that? <laughs> For the benefit of us, he will sometimes shut up the rain. Anybody gone through any dry times? Did you run from him or did you just... <laughs> I'm not going to ask that. I, I, I all, all of a sudden got quiet. Dry places. Nobody likes dry places. But I have found that my greatest growth time has been during dry places. It hasn't been mountaintop places. No, you know, there's nothing ever growing upon the mountain. It's always down there in the valley where the lush green is. It, the mountaintops are wonderful, and I just love those high places. And Brenda and I, we always talk about, ah, I'm, I'm, I'm on the high places today. We love the prophetic and all of that. But I've found that my character growth you know, I mean, I might be enlightened spiritually, you know, as far as uh, having revelation on the, on the mountaintops, but it's working all that revelation out in, <laughs> in the valleys that hurt. Amen? Because unless it's made life in us, unless it's made the, the, it's rhema in us, unless it's become a part of us, then you just had revelation knowledge. I know a lot of people with a lot of revelation knowledge in their life is the pits. I mean, they can prophesy until the cows come home, and it'll be accurate and true, but there's no peace in their life, there's no joy in their life, because so often they just skip from place to place to place to place to prophesy. Amen? And they never go through the, the times of, of staying in the valley until God has worked the character that he's desiring. So he says when he shuts up heaven and there's no rain, or commands the locusts to devour the land, or sends pestilence among my people, Ooh, that's a hard word. But he gives this promise in verse 14. And this is such, uh, everybody should have this on their refrigerator, on their bathroom mirror. If my people who are called by my name will first humble themselves. Now that's not just humbling yourself to God. That'll be humbling yourself toward people. Oh, I can humble myself. Oh, I can get down and I can weep and cry and repent in front of him. But oh, when it means I've got to go to my sister-in-law, and you know she's never liked me. She's always been jealous of me. And she done me wrong, and I didn't do anything, but she did me wrong. And so there's this big wall, or it might be your mother-in-law, <laughs> or it could be your mother. Oh, it might be your husband. Well, anyway, it could, I'm, I'm, I'm meddling now, aren't I? But anyway, when we see that we need to humble ourselves. It is not just vertical, but it's horizontal as well. There was the trespass offering and there was the sin offering uh, in the Old Testament, which spoke of making relations right with God and then relations right with man. And so this is going to be a prerequisite to position ourselves for his presence. Humbling ourselves. And if we'll pray, because actually we can't pray with any power and we can't pray with any influence unless we have made things right with people. Jesus taught that, did he not? He said, if you're down and you're, you brought your alms to the altar and you remember an offense that your brother has against you, not necessarily that you have against your brother, that means that second mile, that extra mile we have to go, then we're to go to them and we're to make that right, if at all possible, and then we can come back and our offering will be, will be accepted. So this is very important for us. We humble ourselves, pray, and then we'll seek his face with a, with a clean heart. Amen? And turn from our wicked ways. Then he says he will hear then. He'll hear from heaven. We wonder why our prayers aren't heard. Well, there's pretty good instruction just in those four, four items or four items. Issues that he dealt with, humbling, praying, seeking his face, and turning from the wicked ways. Those four things, if we 
are obedient to do what his word says, he will hear from heaven. He will forgive our sins. Thank you, Jesus. And then he will heal our land. Now, I believe because we are spit and dirt also, that he's not just talking about the, the, the terra firma, but he's also talking about our bodies too. That there will be much healing that is going to be released. Amen? Now, I'm, I'm going to wind up with this. Compassion and mercy are synonymous. They are two words that mean basically the same thing. I mean, we could probably dissect them and see a little bit of difference in, in it, but uh, many times the translators use, use mercy in lieu of compassion and compassion in lieu of mercy. Now, Jesus said in the Beatitudes, blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy. And you know, through your life, it's wonderful what God will do by just having people drop little words and they didn't even know how much they were affecting your life, but words that change your life. Just, just a sentence. And I remember years ago, probably in the 70s, I was doing a women's uh, meeting, Bible study, a home Bible study. And I had a, a, a lady there, precious lady, and she was talking to me about some concerns. Her son was going with a girl who'd been married and divorced, and they were getting a lot of flack from, the, from the, uh, their church and so on and so forth. And she was saying, you know, she's a precious girl, and she's, she's a Christian and all of that, but her son, this was going to be his first wife. And so she was in all of this conflict, and she said, you know, I just don't know what to do. Uh, what, would you, what would you say? And I said, well, you know, that's, a, that's an issue that you're going to have to work out in your own family. She says, well, basically, you know, what I, I, I was feeling as I was praying about it because she says she's so precious. She said, I would like the Lord to make his accusation against me when I get to heaven be that you were too merciful. <laughs> if God's going to hold something against you, because she was, she was, you know, encouraging him to go ahead and marry her if, if, if they felt they loved each other. And, and uh, you know, she was just wanting to know from the Christian perspective. And that was like a, 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 a rhema word that came into my heart. And I said, God, I want to carry that all of my life. I want, if you're going to find some fault against me, when I stand before your throne, let it be, Lila, you were just too merciful. I'd a whole lot rather him say that than you were too critical. You were not nice to people. You didn't, if he, if his, if the only thing that he had to say against me was I was too merciful, I think I could live with that. Amen? Because that would be an identification with him. He's merciful. And he said, blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy. And I'll tell you what, I've tried to live by that because I've needed mercy lots of times. <laughs> Am I standing alone? Oh, I have needed mercy. I have needed mercy. God's kindness and kindness through people. You know, we talk about that cast your bread upon the water and it'll return to you. We always think, we, we quite often think about that in the area of finances. But you know, we need to think about that in the area of our treatment of one another. And I'm going to close with this thought. Uh, another person who dropped a little nugget. One day she probably doesn't even remember the conversation, but Joyce Strang from Charisma Magazine was here. I think, I think it was here someplace. Anyway, and we were having a conversation, and she said something that stuck so deep in my spirit. She said that before the current move of the Holy Spirit uh, in the last couple of decades, you know, where the, the fresh revival or renewal or whatever you want to call it, even before it had begun here in America, they were summoned to a church, and uh, they were going to cover it in the magazine, and there was a lot of conflict and so on. And so she was not even wanting to go to the conference or whatever it was. And uh, she was, that afternoon, she was praying in her room, and she said, I, I, she was kind of grumbling. <laughs> and she said, Lord, she said, I don't even want to go. She says, what am I going to see when I get there? And he said to her, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And I have used that as a gauge in my own life. When I want to judge something, when I think, you know, I'm, I have an opinion about something, which <laughs> we have no opinions, you know. I have an opinion about something and all that. I have to do my own heart check. 
Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. That can turn any situation around, any situation. The most unlovely people, if we will have our heart condition right, we're going to see something of God. Amen? And so she said that set her up for the move of God. She said when, when the laughter came and the Rodney Howard Brown and there was so much conflict, and the, she said we went to their meetings and I saw God. I saw God. She said, and when the Toronto started and all of the, you know, hoopla about that, she said, I went there. I saw God. She came down here to Brownsville, and she said she saw God. She wasn't fixing on this manifestation or that or what this person was doing or that. To the pure in heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And so our hearts, it's all about the heart. And you'll never hear me minister hardly without mentioning that everything with God has to do with the heart. Heart condition, the church needs heart surgery. Amen. We need to have our hearts circumcised. We need to have our, the stony part of our heart. We, you want to be used by God to influence for healing and deliverance and miracles. And that's one of the things, and, and God help me if I've, if I've evaluated this incorrectly but through the years so many of the people that have I, I have known in deliverance ministry we're not talking about present time we're talking about in the past it seemed to be all about power all about power you know get the devils out but where was the compassion it was like <laughs> you just about saw me I wasn't gonna fall under the it wouldn't be falling under the power it'd, it'd be called got my heel hooked on one of these marble it would have been a show Ah, oh, you missed that one. Boy, I sure am sorry. <laughs> it's about compassion. If we want to see people set free, it's got to be through the heart. It's got to be through compassion. It's got to be through compassion, loving the person, loving with a pure heart the person. Stand with me, please. Ooh. You gave me five minutes of grace. See, I told you I was going to need some mercy. <laughs> Hallelujah. I want to lead us in a corporate prayer. I want us to put our hand over our heart. And I want you if, you, if you mean it, I want you to repeat it with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I am positioning myself for your presence. I ask you, Lord, I ask you, Lord to, touch to touch my heart, to place mercy, to place, mercy, to place, compassion, to place compassion, to place grace, to place grace and, to place love and to place love within my heart. I give you permission, Lord, to drive out everything that would hinder. Oh give, me heart oh, give me heart surgery. Change my heart. Change my heart. And change my, mind. change my mind. I ask you, Lord, to renew my mind. Transform it. Change it. And Lord, I want to be a part of what you're doing. We say, Jesus, please give us an open heaven this weekend. Lord, we want to see your signs, and we want to see your miracles. We want to see deliverance. We want to see your people set free. And we want to be a part of that army that you're raising up in this day to bring in the harvest. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless.